if you take essential amino acids before you train, you will get more benefit than if you hadn't. Mm. And it will be significantly more than also protein. Some food is more anabolic than others. It is, sense. yeah. Mm. And so here's what's interesting. What has been uncovered in the last 10 years is that the peak concentration of essential amino acids from whole food or from a protein powder from a supplement in the blood is the indicator of how much additional muscle protein synthesis will be generated. So here's what's fascinating. And I I, I want to- You know what I'm going to ask you? I want to know which one's the most anabolic. Yeah, oh, no, we're going to get, we're gonna get into it. We're going to get into it. Angelo, welcome to the show. Sal, thanks for having me. So you're here representing Keon. Give us a little background of uh, of yourself and then tell us a little bit about Keon before we get into the conversation. And today we're really going to talk about a subject that um, we've been on kind of either side of, we, we have pr some pretty strong opinions on, essential amino acids. That's what you're here to talk about mainly, but give us a little background and tell us a little about Keon before we get into that. First of all, I love to be here because I, I have thought of you historically as kind of essential amino acid skeptics. Yes. <laughs> and so I'm like, yes, man, we're going to go right into like tank. the yeah. belly of the beast and yeah. talk about it and see, uh, yeah, see what shakes out. Okay. Um, and I think it's just become like way more of a hot topic. It's, uh, it'd be good. It'd be good to dig into the science and see like what's legit and Please. what's not. Um, I guess like my, my personal story of like how yeah. I ended like up how'd here, you end up here? Yeah. how'd I end up here? Uh, I was raised in a family that was super into natural health. Um, like we were just talking about right before we started recording. I grew up in Austin. I was born in a little town outside Austin by two very hippie people. My dad actually was like a importer of botanicals, like ginseng in the seventies. <laughs> nice. Oh wow. And that was hard to get back then too. Yeah. yeah. And, um, and a bunch of other botanicals. And then they ended up having a natural health food store, a natural health food restaurant. I was born at home. I didn't get a birth certificate till I was seven. Uh, wow. all like whole natural foods, but also lots of like vitamins and supplements mm -hmm. and no over the counter drugs, none of that stuff. And, uh, my parents also curiously chose to be pescatarian. I think it was like a thing in, mm -hmm. in like Austin at that time, <laughs> uh, that said, because they were knowledgeable, they knew that protein nutrition was important. So we mm -hmm. talked about it like a lot. Like we talked about combining different types of plant proteins. If we weren't eating eggs or dairy, even as a kid, or, no, I'm like four years old. And like, I knew like, no, you <laughs> like Angie, you have to combine, you know, the beans and the rice, the lentils and the quinoa, mm -hmm. because these things are incomplete amino on acid their own. combinations. Yeah. 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 I mean, like that's like, I was, that was the conversation as a kid. Interesting. And, um, you know, so I think any of us, you grow up in an environment and you, you don't really know like that it's unique or different or special. You're just kind of, we're all kind of brainwashed by our parents to some degree. Right. I go into school and clearly now it's weird. You know, like the stuff I bring to <laughs> lunch is weird. Like I have a little piece of like salmon, and, you know, like broccoli and stuff. And other kids get to eat like gushers and stuff. Uh, but as I, you know, grow older, um, probably the other tendencies in my family are that they were very entrepreneurial, thus a bit manic, kind of intense, very alternative. And, you know, I, that's in me. So the, the same, I say the same spirits in me, right? So I start experimenting. I'm pushing away pretty early from my family, um, you know, getting really into social stuff, getting to high school, get into drugs. Um, of, of course, food comes into that. You know, I'm going to McDonald's with friends now. That's and, how you rebel. Yeah, that's how I rebel. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's more than, I'd say it's more wild than McDonald's, but that was part of it. <laughs> okay. And, um, you know, I think there was a pinnacle moment when I was 16 uh, and a half. It was the day after my sophomore year. I took too much LSD. Uh, I was with a friend. Uh, I took too much LSD kind of like twice that evening. And I just lost my mind. Um, and I was in a part of town that wasn't the best part of town. And it was in a kind of public environment. And I upset, pissed off these people that were more hardcore than me. I mean, I was coming from like kind of a more scared place. Um but I upset them and un un intentionally provoke them. And they, you know, just beat the shit out of me. And they stabbed me twice in the back. Oh, wow. shit. And they stabbed me in the knee. So, you know, while you're on LSD? In the middle of the worst trip you can possibly like oh melting. Oh, my God. Trip. Horrible. Yeah. Did so you know that, in itself, that in itself could be a bad experience, but uh, adding getting stabbed to that. Did you is, even know what was happening? Were, were you aware uh, enough to know that you I, were being hit and stabbed? Or uh, I have like moments of consciousness that I remember after that, but it's not like, I don't, I don't, I still don't like piece it together. Like perfectly. Wow. Yeah. Um, and obviously, I mean, I've done a ton of therapy and other of types of like <laughs> modalities to try to like 
uh, put my life together, put my mind together, be able to be, you know, present. Um, but yeah, I have a huge scar down my, you know, abdomen from my having emergency abdominal surgery. My patellar tendon had to be reattached. It was like totally severed. And, you know, I wake up in the hospital a week later and I'm just totally black and blue. And, you know, I've got staples all over me and, um, I'm 16 and a half. And it's like the biggest just introduction, I think, to adulthood that I've ever, ever heard of, you know, personally, it's from someone I know where it's just like, man, like all of the decisions you make or you don't make create your life. You know, it's like I've been given certain things by my family, like beliefs they gave me and opportunities and school and all that. But like now the decisions I make are going to they're going to they're going to manifest the rest of my life. Mm. And um, I mean, later I was diagnosed with PTSD and obviously like w- went through a lot to try to fix it. And I think at that moment, I really was like, man, I'm going to like it, it wasn't a perfect path. Right. It's been very messy. That was I'm 40 now. So that was 24 years ago. It wasn't a perfect path, but it became like. I'm really going to try. Like, I'm really going to try to be as healthy as I can be, like emotionally, mentally, physically. And at that time, I rediscovered protein um, as one piece of that. I mean, obviously, I rediscovered like therapy Mm -hmm. or discovered therapy for the first time and discovered meditation and yoga and breath work and a bunch of other stuff. But um, I discovered how important my daily protein intake was to my recovery. Um, I had lost a ton of muscle mass and I was just like really weak and I couldn't really do stuff. I mean, I lost, I don't, I don't remember exactly how many pounds, like probably 30 pounds in the process. And I wasn't like a a fat dude before that. Um, and so I really started paying attention to my protein intake. And that's when I started like taking whey protein powder and, uh, thinking more about how I was training, et cetera. And, you know, over the next several years, I, um, I experimented with all different types of diets and I was in Austin too, which is like a hotbed of natural, you know, health ideas and health and fitness and stuff like that. So I had a lot of opportunities to pursue a lot of different ideas. And, um, you know, I think got a lot healthier, a lot fitter again. And from a place that was like, again, not like what my parents made me think, like you need to eat these foods and we all go to the gym and, you know, Mm -hmm. but like for me and, um, maybe circuitously, I, Went in a lot of different ways after that. I like lived overseas for several years. I moved to France, had a whole career over there, went to India, moved back to the States, uh, moved to Boulder where I live now, uh, ran a behavioral healthcare company for a few years. And then, you know, the way I, it seems like what happened is I kind of just came back to my roots. I mean, there was a way in which I had been raised in a family that really cared about nutrition, particularly really cared about talking and thinking about protein nutrition. And I wound up starting this like protein kind of centric supplement company in 2017. And in that journey, um, naturally, like I thought I knew a lot already. Like I thought I knew a lot about the subject. And when you really try to dig into it and then start to work with the leading scientists and researchers in the field and read all their work and, you know, hire them to, to teach you and to work with you, you learn a lot more. And so through that journey, um, you know, we've, I've had the experience of getting to iterate on different types of formulas to really understand what is inside protein powders and essential amino acid supplements, what's important, uh, and what really the leading research has shown over the last few years. And um, so I think that's why I'm here today. Any any <laughs> big epiphanies for somebody who has uh, so much information, knowledge, experience like from four years old on with, with protein, understanding all that, then all of a sudden you get into building a company around it. You're probably diving in the studies. Anything that like jumps out right away, like, oh shit, all these years I thought this, didn't realize that. The, the biggest thing I think that a lot of people don't realize is that essential amino acids in, in protein, in food that you eat, is not only important because uh, your body can't synthesize it, which is typically what we talk about and explore. It's like, oh, there's not essential amino acids, which your body can actually make if you consume the essential. But the essential are the ones you have to eat because if you don't, you, you, die. you die, which is true. But essential amino acids are not only this thing that are a building block for new proteins, they're actually the active component of the protein. They're the part of the protein that stimulates muscle protein synthesis and whole body protein synthesis. So, you know, for example, I like when I try to explain, you know, protein to people uh, as something different than carbohydrates and fat, I like to use this metaphor of like a house. So if you want to run 
your house and everything in your house, your dishwasher, your lights, your TV, et cetera. You need to get energy from outside. So you get it from the grid or solar panels, mm -hmm. or you could use natural gas, or if you, you know, power went out, you could run a generator, um, but you got to get energy in. That's carbohydrates and fat. That's their primary focus, right? I mean, there's other roles of fat, but that's, that's the primary focus. Protein is fundamentally different. Protein is your house. Protein is what is used to rebuild your house. Mm -hmm. So for example, in the same way that you know, if I, I have carpet in my front entryway and I walk over it over and over and over again, it starts to wear out. Similarly, our bodies do the same thing. So while <clears throat> carbohydrates and fat are the fuel that we consume, that then gets converted into ATP and allows us to like move through space, protein actually replaces the proteins in our body. All of our vital organs, our muscle, our skin, our hair, our nails, but even things like enzymes and hormones are all proteins. And the way that proteins function in nature and in our body is that they don't last forever. Every protein gets old, it degrades, and then it breaks apart. And so if I look at my skin and I see this piece of protein, you know, I, I see there's, there's actually, I don't see, but I know there's millions of proteins in my skin. Each individual one reaches an end of how long it's functional. It breaks down. And when it breaks down, it breaks apart into the little amino acids. Some of them are no longer useful and I pee them out. The ones that can be reused stay in circulation in my blood and they can be used to build a new protein. Mm. That's why I eat protein. When I consume a chicken breast, I digest the protein, the amino acids get released into my blood, and then they go and they work with those other previous amino acids to rebuild tissue, to rebuild muscles, to rebuild enzymes. So you have to eat protein in order to literally rebuild your body. But protein is not only the building blocks, it's not only the, the, the carpet, it's not only the hardwood floors, it's the essential amino acids are the actual workers that come in and rip up the old carpet and install the new carpet. They play a very distinct primary role that is completely different than non-essential amino acids. And so I think oftentimes in the debate around trying to understand what protein is or complete protein is, it gets lost that uh, this, this very important role of essential amino acids as distinct from the fact that they're essential. Hey, sorry to interrupt. Look, if this episode's blowing your mind, Angelo works with Keon. This is the best company that we found for essential amino acids. If you go to getkeon.com forward slash mind pump, they'll give you 20% off on essential amino acids. All right, back to the show. Is it safe to say that we have decent storage mechanic mechanisms for carbohydrates in the form of glycogen fat in the form of body fat? But proteins, we don't really store very well, right? Like, like we store them in, 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 in terms of tissue, but if to break it down to use because we need, not very, not a very great process. Is that, would you say that's safe? I would say that the, while, well, yes, glycogen stores would be like the short term storage yes. of carbs. Fat, like body fat, is the long term store of energy, energy, fuel. The long term, long term storage reservoir of amino acids or protein, but fundamentally amino acids, is muscle. Right. That is why it's so fundamentally important to build and maintain lean muscle as we age, because when you get older and or really any time in life, but if you undergo some type of chronic illness or injury um, and then as you or as you get older and you have a harder time maintaining that lean muscle, you have other needs for amino acids. Like, for example, my heart tissue, it's going to start to it, it goes through some form of protein turnover. The proteins in my heart break down. They mm -hmm. have to be rebuilt. I can't just like not rebuild them. I have to rebuild that mm -hmm. heart tissue. So where do I get the amino acids from to do it? My muscle. Your muscle is the reservoir. So rather than saying like you don't have good storage, we actually do have pretty good storage. It's muscle. But that is the only storage that you have. And right. so but it's a whole nother- You have to keep replenishing and rebuilding it, otherwise you, you're screwed. You have to keep building yeah. and replenishing it. And I, that is why the outcomes of older people with less muscle are so much worse yeah, than I, those with more muscle. That's right. Because I remember learning this a long time ago. I remember I was taking a course on nutrition and the instructor talked about how um, when you lose muscle because you change your form of exercise and you diet, you go into calorie deficit and do lots of cardio, let's say, and you start to lose muscle. It's part of an adaptation process. And I remember him saying, your body doesn't want to burn muscle for energy. That's not what's happening. It's paring it down. And it was like a light bulb for me. Like, oh, it, it, the, the burning of muscle to get protein isn't necessarily a great option. Your body doesn't want to do that. Your body wants to keep its muscle it'll pare it down as form as a form of adaptation, but it's not paring it down because it needs the proteins. If that happens, then you're in real trouble. If your body's losing muscle because you're not getting enough protein, you're in big trouble. 
Is that safe? Would you say that's safe to say? That is safe to say uh, when you're talking about the protein already in your muscle. Right. So like yes. the, the uh, if you go into a caloric deficit, a couple things are happening. Um, the protein that you used to eat to just rebuild the proteins in your body, like the, you eat the exact same amount of chicken as you used to eat, or right. you, you eat somewhere between 0.7 grams and 1.2 grams of protein per pound of, uh, per pound of your own body weight per day. Um, typically in the past, you would actually use that just to rebuild your right. proteins, rebuild your muscle. But if you reduce the amount of calories you get per day, suddenly your body does think that that external source of protein it's like, I'm not going to prioritize this to rebuild muscle. And it converts more of that dietary food protein that you're eating into, into sugars. It does do that. Okay. That said, in your own body, like, no, you're not burning, like the way that like you're actually living off the fat, like the fat in yeah. your body is being burned to fuel the energy. You're not burning the muscle to then be converted into a fuel source. What's happening is that you have to have enough um amino acids to help rebuild your enzymes, your hormones, your vital organs, all these things. And so it's breaking down the muscle tissue to supply amino acids to the rest of the body for all these other things to function. So it's not for energy. It's for like, uh, I, maybe you got like a hole in your roof. And so you remove the floorboards from got your it. living room and go put it not to turn the to lights patch on, it, but to patch, to patch the hole. Got it. Now, mm -hmm. is this why we see that, uh, when we train clients and this is, you know, bodybuilders talk about this all the time why high protein intake becomes more important as your uh, calorie calories day. drop? It becomes way more important. Okay. Yeah, it becomes way more important. So I think typically overall, when, when we talk about how much protein someone should eat in a day, there's a lot of variables. And I think, I mean, I've heard you guys say it, and I think it's a wise advice just to say about a gram of protein per pound of body mm -hmm. weight. That's, it's a good, it's a good piece of advice that covers a lot of different situations, but ultimately it's, there are many factors at play, how old you are, how active you are, if you're trying to lose fat and maintain muscle, if you have some type of illness or injury, et cetera. And so what I would say is if you're in a situation in which you're kind of in like maintenance mode, you probably can do a little less. You're, you're in maintenance mode. And you're not like a huge jack dude. You could probably do a little less than a gram of protein per pound of body weight. Um, that said, as soon as you want to get into trying to lose fat and maintain muscle becomes that much more important. And recent studies from the last few years sponsored actually by the U.S. military because they're trying to understand how to deal with soldiers in the field that are going through caloric restriction. because and stress. Said, like, yeah, stress and all this stuff. It was shown that in order to maintain a net protein balance, meaning like you don't burn that muscle. You don't convert, you don't break. You don't positive bre protein synthesis. Yes, positive protein synthesis. So you don't break down muscle. More, you don't break down more muscle to supply the rest of your organs, et cetera, with amino acids. And so that you end this phase with actually more equal to or more muscle that it was required to increase the essential amino acid intake by three times wow. on a 30% caloric deficit. So they took these, they're, the, and the subjects were young males. So this is not even like a, Old this is not like old people where yeah. it's going to be more, more important, but for young, these young males, they had to increase the dosage of the essential amino acids threefold to have a net protein balance. So it becomes way more important. I would say that someone who's in an aggressive caloric restriction should be thinking way above actually a gram of protein per pound. Of now, body. does that change based off? Cause you said amino acids. What if they had like whole protein from whole foods? Does that make a difference or is it the same? Would it be the same amount? So, um, and this is me just trying to be nuanced. The study I'm talking about is specifically measuring, it's actually keeping people on 0.7 grams of protein per pound of body weight uh, daily diet, and they're only reducing carbohydrates and fat. And then they're using essential amino acids as a clinical intervention to try to help them maintain their lean muscle. You potentially could also do it with something like a protein powder right. or whole food protein. You would need more because- you know, essential amino acids, even in a whey protein powder, which is like the most ideal mm -hmm. protein type supplement you could take, only 45% of it is essential amino acids. Okay. So you need to be taking at least twice that amount of whey protein. But I, I think what's more interesting, and this is an interesting introduction into like, it's not just the essential amino acid content. It's actually how digestible the essential amino acid is. Bioavailability is that the what we're bioavailability about? is what okay. we're talking about, and this is you know it's a typical kind of debate between yeah. plant based eaters and animal yes. animal protein mm -hmm. eaters. Mm -hmm. But let's actually just exclude the plant based folks for a second because it's really stimulating and interesting. Even if you only look at um, animal based proteins, 
and this is everything I'm talking about is covered in the International Society of Sport Nutrition position paper that came out last year or related articles to that. People like Dr. Arnie Ferrando, Dr. David Church, Dr. Robert Wolf. These guys are like the leading researchers. In okay. this. It's all really widely published available information. Um, but what leads to muscle protein synthesis? So muscle protein, and I'm sure you guys have talked about this before on the show, but just to make sure everyone's on, like listeners are on the same page, muscle protein synthesis just means that um, your body makes new proteins at the site of the muscle. Mm. Like it like it builds muscle. That, that said, it doesn't necessarily mean hypertrophy. It doesn't necessarily mean building more muscle. It could also be uh, like muscle protein turnover, replacing older muscle fibers with newer ones. Yeah, so but positive it, protein mm-hmm. synthesis would be more than you're breaking down. Uh-huh. Negative would be more less than you're breaking down and then maintaining would be the same. Yes. Okay. But if you're increasing the amount of protein synthesis, it could just be turnover. It could just be replacing old ones with new ones. Got it. Mm-hmm. Or it could be actually making more total muscle okay. tissue. So um, what leads to muscle protein synthesis, obviously resistance training right. supports muscle protein, stimulates, pro- that, stimulates right. it. Yeah. But uh, this is maybe the the point going back to, you know, Adam's question earlier. It's like, what, what did I not know? Or what blew my mind? The food itself stimulates muscle protein synthesis, yeah. which I think a lot of people don't get. They think, no, the stimulus is the weight training and the food is just like the support. Yeah, food. some food is more anabolic than others. It is, sense. yeah. Mm-hmm. And so here's what's interesting. What has been uncovered in the last 10 years is that the peak concentration of essential amino acids from whole food or from a protein powder from a supplement in the blood is the indicator of how much additional muscle protein synthesis will be generated. So it's a strong connection or is it a correlation? Direct correlation. Okay. Direct correlation. They have an exact formula. You wow. can like look at the formulas and they do this through- and so you can rate this, this source of protein because it causes this much of an essential amino acid uh, jump in the blood is more anabolic than this one, which causes a lower one, yes. even though the grams are protein the same or whatever. Yes, exactly. Okay. Exactly. Wow. So here's what's fascinating. And I I, I want to... Before- you know what I'm going to ask you? I want to know which one's the most anabolic. Yeah. Oh, no, we're going to get, get into it. We're going to get into it. Yeah. Well, here's one thing I want to point out, though. I think this whole conversation, like, I think one thing that I like about you guys and that I think has been a reason why you've typically been more supplement skeptic, right, is like, hey, how do you give people, like, meaningful information and, like... Uh, things they can adhere to and follow and find real change. And when you right. make things too complicated or you make it to where like people have to do this and then do that. And then they have to take this yeah. product. It's, it's, convoluted. it's like, man, yeah. it's like people like, is it helping people, you right. know, or can you just, does it really matter? Or can you just like make it simpler? So someone will actually do the training right. and eat the protein versus like, think they have to combine this pill with that pill. So right. I just want to, I want to say like, I respect you guys for that. And I would name, I would advise everyone before getting this conversation, like eat whole food meals eat whole food mixed meals because they're good. That's what I like to do. Yeah. Like I like to eat steak and potatoes and broccoli because it's delicious and I like to eat it with my family and it's good for and me. it's real life. It's real life. Yeah. It's, it's awesome and it's yeah. got good stuff in it. So having said that, 70 grams of beef protein as part of a mixed meal stimulates a little less muscle protein synthesis than 30 grams of beef protein when eaten on its own. And neither is actually that much. They actually don't stimulate that much. Whole food protein doesn't really stimulate that much muscle protein synthesis above baseline. That's mm. that's not saying it's not good. It's like do some weight training, eat a whole food meal. That's a good decision. But just right, scientifically- there's, some, there's a bit of caveats here too, right? Because yeah. because you're still, you're, 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 the whole food meal is going to give you more calories. That plays mm-hmm. a role. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You could have great synthesis, but your calories are too low and you get, nothing's going to happen. So, so there's a lot of caveats here, right? Yes. But, the, but, but that's a very interesting thing to identify. So you maximize uh, synthesis when you just eat it by itself. By itself. When you eat it by itself. Yeah. And the reason why that's weird. is because yeah. the digestion of the beef protein on its own is more easily accomplished without the interference of the other foods. Got it. Mm. I swear the, we learned opposite of that. I thought we always learned that pairing it with a carbohydrate, right. you would get, you would maximize those benefits. It's actually because the insulin so, response. Like shuttling yeah. It, yeah. Yeah. So there, there has been a, a lot of research specific to what you're saying. Yeah. If you, if you take a, a carbohydrate, it has an insulin spike that then supports and that the muscle protein synthesis. But um, when you're talking about these whole foods, like that's, that's simply not the case. And there's actually oh. pretty mm. interesting, we can get into it maybe later, but a NASA study, from 2004 where they did these bed rest studies with essential amino acids and, and carbohydrates uh, for that same reason. But then they later realized they didn't even need the carbohydrates, that the essential amino acids on their own created the spike. Interesting. So, I mean, all this to say too, like 
for you guys and for listeners, there's a lot going on in the body and there's a lot of different dimensions yeah. to nutrition. But when measured purely in terms of muscle protein synthesis, you get a slightly bigger, a slightly, I mean, it's basically equal for, th- okay. for 30 grams of beef protein versus 70 if eaten on its own. Because right. you break down the beef, you digest the beef more easily and the EAAs that are within the beef hit the bloodstream more quickly and have this kind of yeah. peak concentration, whereas if it's mixed with the other food. I'm glad, I'm, I really like the way you preface this though, because uh, if I were listening and I, like if I was 18 year old Sal, okay, and I'm listening to this, <laughs> immediately I'm, I'm like, cool, I'm blending cool. my meat. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. It's faster. <laughs> it's faster. Staked and my brain, yeah, and Angelo it. said, I'm going to get a higher essential amino acid. Mm-hmm. And so, and then I would ignore all the benefits of digesting mm-hmm. your food and mm-hmm. chewing on it, the digest enzymes mm-hmm. and all the other stuff that you get from it. So I'm glad you prefaced it the way you did, but this still is very fascinating. So, so it has this has to do with the digestion. Is that what they're saying? This has, this has to do with the digestion. Basically, okay. hmm. the uh, ability of the essential amino acids to reach the blood more quickly and he hit this peak concentration. So now here's this is where it gets really interesting. Whey protein powder, on a gram for gram basis, has about three times the peak concentration as beef. Yeah. So why is that? So the whey protein powder is, it has, you know, maybe slightly better EAA um, kind of proportions, like the proportions of the EAs to each other. And it's slightly higher than the beef. It's like a little over 45%. It's one of the fastest absorbing proteins. Yeah. Um, But that's basically what it is. It's so easy for the body to digest that the EAAs hit the blood way more quickly. So this, this though, I think becomes kind of a practical point then. It's like, okay, well, if I'm trying to uh, supplement my diet, Right. And I eat three meals a day, but on top of that, I'm trying to sneak in like a little bit more protein because yeah. it's hard for me to hit that one gram of protein per pound of body weight. The whey protein shake that you make is more efficient and more effective than just trying to eat another 20 grams of beef. Yeah. It's three times, to- I mean, in terms of the, the plasma EAA levels, it's three times the I'm going to back you up on this mm. because unless you're like me and a lot of people who can't digest dairy very well, right? So I, dairy doesn't work for me. So the mm-hmm. digestive uh, benefits don't work for me. But mm-hmm. if you digest dairy well, um, whey is even recommended for people with gut issues mm-hmm. because of its ease of digestibility so long as you don't have intolerance issues. They actually recommend it to people with uh, Crohn's disease and people with, you know, other type of digestive issues. And I've seen that for a while. So very interesting. What's the most anabolic whole source of protein they're finding? <laughs> you knew that was coming. <laughs> uh, so what I would say is if you're talking about just like whole food on its own, yes. um, it's, you I mean, you're basically looking at what has the highest proportion of EAAs and it, it is, is I mean, it egg? It, it's egg, it's egg yeah. dairy. Actually. Like if you take dairy on its own, dairy has the highest D I A A S score. But just it's great like dairy, to see the egg. advice we've been given since day one and just having <laughs> yeah. a gla- whole, t- tall glass of uh, whole milk, you know, man, the milk really milk. I mean, that's why Huge I give to my kids. My kids yeah. drink a lot of whole milk. Like I'm, I'm all on it. Yeah. Like parmesan. Parmesan cheese, man. That's that's a great one. <laughs> is this, um, I told you guys. Is this a safe statement to say? Hey, sorry to interrupt. Look, I have a free guide that teaches you how to lose fat in three steps, just three steps that will burn the most amount of body fat and help keep it off. This guide is totally free. We're giving it to everybody right now. If you want it, click on the link at the top of the description below. All right, back to the show. Uh-huh. That a high protein diet is less important in a bulk than it is in a cut. Mmm. I don't, I don't think that that's necessary. I don't think that's necessarily true. What I mean, what I would say is they're important, but for different reasons. Okay. Explain. Right. So, um, I just want to say though, I want to get back to the previous conversation because it's what introduces like the, the supplements, something like BCAAs or EAAs and what role they play. But let's go here first. So for a bulk, I mean, you, you're trying to add mass, Right. right? You're trying to actually build new proteins at the level of the muscle. So you need to eat a lot of food. What I would say is more the issue is you probably need to eat other additional calories. That's what I'm saying. In addition to the protein. Whereas um, when you're trying to cut the, the the fat and maintain the lean mass. Then it becomes more important. Well, then, then you, I, yeah, I guess you're, I guess it's true. It is more important. Like if I'm going to tell someone yeah. to eat one uh-huh. and a half grams of protein per pound of body weight, it'll I, be the cut. Not the, I would do it during the cut. Yep. Okay, I that's what I'm trying to say. Cut. Yes, I would do it during the cut. So if you're because the other the other person, as long as they're in a surplus of calories, it could come from carbohydrates or fats, and as long as they're hitting their protein intake, they're essentially yes, fine. Yes, but if you're well, so, and they're, they're, at the gram, they're at like a gram, yeah, of protein that's what I mean. Both yeah. high protein, yeah, but like excessively high, probably more important for the cut. Yes, is based on what you're saying. Okay. The other thing I would just say, like probably in a more like broader health perspective too, 
it's more important to retain muscle than to build it. Like if I had to choose, right? I would also say like- Oh yeah, losing muscle. Yeah, like right. losing muscle is like a way bigger issue. And mm -hmm. I think, and I don't know who all the listeners of the show are, but like so many people go on different types of diets mm -hmm. and are looking at the scale and trying to lose weight, not realizing, you know, the muscle loss that's occurring. And I would just say like the the protection of your muscle- Oh, it's huge. As the like most- I think probably the most important savings account for mm -hmm. your health, for, oh, for, for sure. your full life, like protect that. And yeah. so, yes, I would, if I had to choose, I would say more protein during the cut is more important. Yeah. And it's going to, it is certainly going to become a way higher proportion of your calories. That's, that's, that's got to be a way higher proportion. But, of your by the calories. way, this is old school bodybuilding. That's exactly uh, yeah. what I This is not yeah. like, yeah. They, 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 I mean, it's funny because they explained it wrong, but they, yeah. but they knew something because <laughs> they found that their athletes did better <clears throat> when their protein intake was really high in their crazy cuts. And when their, when their calories were high, they weren't so, they had high protein still, they're bodybuilders, but it wasn't nearly as important. Mm -hmm. So that's why I asked you that question. How, how, how much does like the intensity of training dictate this also? Like when you're in a cut, you're low calorie, mm -hmm. And that, like, it, does the protein intake or the essential amino acids become uh, even more important if, like, let's say you're a long distance runner or you train really hard and aggressive for an hour or two? Does that factor in or play a role in this? Yeah. And for two really important reasons one is on the energy level. So if you are in a caloric deficit, or you're not even in a caloric deficit, you're like, this is the amount of calories you would normally eat in a day. But on this day, you exercise way more than that. Mm -hmm. Well, then now you're in a caloric deficit. Right. Because like you didn't eat the additional calories you needed to consume for to hit those needs to maintain the balance. And so immediately what happens is, again, your body is going to utilize more of the protein in your diet to be converted into a sugar because it's not prioritizing the maintenance of the muscle because it's, it's hungry. Mm. It's basically, it's like, it's hungry. It needs, it's it, the primary role of the protein is ultimately to help you rebuild the proteins in your body. But if you're starving yourself, it's going to use the protein instead. It's going to wow, convert that, more of it into energy. That seems to explain the paring down process of muscle in, in another way too. It's like, sure. listen, part of the reason why your body's paring down the muscle is you think you're hitting your, what you need in grams of protein. But now because of your high calorie burn and low calorie, your body's now prioritizing Advertising that is like, hey, we need to use some of this as fuel because, and therefore it doesn't go into maintaining or holding your muscle mass on. So now, Angela, I'm going to make a lot of sense. A little pushback, okay? Yeah. Uh -huh. Why wouldn't then supplementing with carbohydrates be protein sparing in that case? So they, they, it's using the extra protein for energy. Mm -hmm. They could be. Why not just supplement? Okay. They could be. Well, I think in that example of the endurance situation, okay. that I think that's a great point. That was an, okay. that was an excellent pushback. Okay. So now I think the, so and as in the specific context of like, hey, this is my general amount of calories, but I'm going and I'm doing this, all this additional exercise. What if I just consumed a bunch more carbohydrates during that period? Right? Which, spare the extra? which a lot of endurance athletes do. Mm -hmm. That said, when you perform uh, any type of exercise and endurance exercise actually does it perhaps more in some ways than resistance exercise, you oxidize an increased amount of amino acids than you typically would. And the reason for that is because amino acids, particularly leucine actually, plays a role at the level of the mitochondria to actually facilitate the energy production. So it's not like, it's not the energy source, but it's facilitating it. At, it's like facilitating the conversion basically okay. of the glucose into the ATP. So you oxidize considerably more. Um, on top of that, as you're oxidizing it, right? This is like where the central fatigue hypothesis mm -hmm. comes from. Um, I'm not sure if you're familiar if you, you guys in your audience is as familiar with that. It's more like an endurance thing. But when you go for a long time with endurance exercise, you can start to bonk, like lose yes. energy. Mm -hmm. But it's not just from the carbohydrates. The hypothesis is actually that because you have been oxidizing so much more leucine to facilitate this energy production and, and to support this overall like muscle breakdown turnover that's happening from the exercise itself, that the levels of your leucine loose, in your blood go down. And that since our brain has a blood brain barrier Interesting. and the leucine and the tryptophan operate on the same pathways, that the amount of tryptophan that gets into the brain becomes increased. And the tryptophan is the precursor of serotonin, mm. which is a softer, more like sleepy type mm. thing. And actually serotonin becomes, uh, you know, 5-HTP, which becomes uh, melatonin. Right. And so, um, that whole process itself, there's this whole other oxidation of the amino acids themselves that are occurring. So it can make sense to for endurance athletes to supplement with additional protein or free form essential amino acids during extended endurance activities or before or during uh, before or after in order to better support literally just the muscle 
well, if it's if it's after, it's supporting the muscle recovery. If it's during, mm-hmm. it's to prevent as much of the actual provoked muscle breakdown. Why, now, wh- mm-hmm. why would we tell someone then? We're talking about essential amino acids, uh, mm-hmm. and essential amino acids. If you look at a good source of you know complete protein, you're going to have your non-essential and essential. It's got all of them. Mm-hmm. Essential amino acids on their own, you can also supplement with, right? You could buy an essential amino acid supplement that doesn't have all the non-essentials. Mm-hmm. It just has the essential ones, which include the branch chain amino acids, mm-hmm. right? Leucine, isoleucine. And valine. Why supplement with the essential amino acids over just taking protein? Why wouldn't I just do a scoop of protein instead of doing a scoop of, you know, essential amino acids? So I'll answer it technically, and then we can get into like, well, what use cases actually make sense, right? right? So technically, going back to the story or the the data that we discussed earlier, which were the 70 grams of the beef protein yes. actually stimulates like as much muscle protein synthesis as 30 grams if it's eaten on its own. And gram for gram, the whey protein is like three times the impact of that beef because it's so much more digestible. And the EAAs, the essential amino acids in the protein, get to the blood so much more quickly. When you take an essential amino acid supplement, assuming it has all nine EAAs and ideally it's leucine enriched, so it's like a higher proportion of the of the total composition is leucine mm-hmm. and the BCAAs and lysine, it has three times the impact as the whey protein powder. Interesting. In young, healthy adults. Okay. And so the reason for that is there's there's two kind of obvious reasons for it. One is what we know is that essential amino acids stimulate all of the muscle protein synthesis. Okay. We've done studies, you know, the scientific community has done studies where they do, you know, beef protein uh, proportions of essential amino acids, like as a supplement, they add in non-essential and they do non-essential on their own. And it's very clear that the non-essential provide no increase in muscle protein synthesis. Going back to Adam's original question, what kind of blew my mind or what have I learned? Essential amino acids are the active component of the protein. They're the thing that tell your body to stimulate protein synthesis. So in this case, with whey protein, only 45% of it is essential amino acids. So 55% is non-essential. That doesn't mean those aren't good things. It doesn't mean that, and there's not other good minerals in the whey protein, but on a gram for gram basis in terms of stimulating muscle protein synthesis, it has half the amount, less than half the amount of the active component. On top of that, that active component in the whey protein still has to be digested to some degree. The free form essential amino acids, just they're immediately digested. They immediately go into the blood and that's why they have such greater impact. So if you're, you know, I I rather I'd say it's like there are two different tools that achieve achieve the same end. If you're trying to, and maybe I would just say this too, like if you're a, if you're in your twenties, right. And you're pretty fit and you're in maintenance mode. I think that a lot of these supplement things we're discussing have less importance okay? because developing really healthy eating habits and exercising and all that is really important. That said, if you're in your twenties and you like want to have that much better, like performance, like in the gym or in a sport or something, supplements start to make more sense. And then it's like, well, why would I take whey versus EAAs? Well, EAAs are way easier to take and to drink. Like they're, you get like three times the impact in a, in like a fruit flavored beverage or taking a few capsules versus having to drink like a whole shake and feel kind of full. That said, if you want more, want to feel, feel that much more full, well then a whey protein could make more sense. That is in young people. As soon as you start to get into a situation with anyone who is more anabolically resistant, which would be people trying to lose weight, people that are aging, basically yeah. at age 30 and every decade after that. Pre-diabetes, gets, yeah, diabetes. Yeah, all these things, it becomes different. So that that example I gave you of the EAAs versus the whey protein, that's for young people. For old people, it's been shown, women in their 60s, that three grams of EAAs stimulate as much muscle protein synthesis as 20 grams of whey protein. So it's over six times the impact. So like us sitting around, I don't know what age you guys are, but I'm 40, we're mm-hmm. around the same age. It's like, we, we probably are somewhere in the middle. We're probably like, it's probably about, it's probably about four times the impact. Um, so like for someone younger, EAAs have about three times the impact at 40, it's about four. And by the time, you know, we're in our sixties, it's going to be potentially six times the impact. Well, as we get older, it starts to make more sense. So what I would say is the younger and healthier and more maintenance mode you are, the less important this whole discussion is, right? And the more that you are older, above 30, right? Is I'm, I'm starting to pay attention, mm-hmm. listen more. Above 40, even more, 50, 60, 70. Or you're in a situation where you're trying to lose fat and maintain muscle. 
and you need so much more essential amino acids ultimately to just stimulate enough muscle protein synthesis, it could be way more efficient to complement or supplement already a high, like a high protein diet with something like essential amino acids than trying to do a whey protein. But I would also say like you can do both. Right. Like they, they're both good solutions. So, all right, so I'll, I'll, I'll sell what you're selling for you and then I'll, I'll push back a little bit and mm -hmm. just ask a question. So mm -hmm. to sell what you're saying and, and back me up if, or, or not, if I don't know if I'm right or wrong here, but if I'm hitting my caloric targets, let's say I'm trying to cut or I just don't want to eat more. Okay? I don't want to mm -hmm. bump my calories anymore, but I want the benefits of extra muscle protein synthesis. Supplementing with essential amino acids doesn't increase my cal my calories or does it increase my calories less than, than taking in protein. Is, in other words, would I benefit from essential amino acids in the sense that I'm not getting the calories? So it's like, oh, my, I already hit my calorie targets, but I want to get more essential amino acids. Let me do this three grams of essential amino acids instead of a 40 gram shake, which is going to give me another, you know, 100 and whatever, 160 calories. Is that safe to say? Um, okay. So taking a step back, the way that calories are understood within food and within supplements follows a few different rules. Okay. And the uh, actual amount of calories in a gram of protein or a gram of carbohydrates or a gram of fat typically are like four, four, nine. Right. Right. But it's not always exactly that. Sure. And it can kind of differ on different types of food, et right. cetera. And the way that the, you know, food industry and supplement industry has regulated things is that you basically describe the content of a food uh, when you say what's in it by using that rule, like the 449 rule. Yes. And because amino acids do not fall into that category. No. They don't, they're not so, technically a complete protein. They're not technically a protein, not even a complete protein, because you could list protein on your supplement facts panel, your nutrition facts panel, like collagen. Right. You could say protein, but it's not a complete protein. Right, right, right. And it's very deficient in stimulating muscle protein sure. synthesis. But it could say it's a protein, whereas with an amino acid supplement, you can't say it's a protein because it's technically okay. not. Therefore, when you measure the grams of protein that are in it, there's none. So it doesn't follow this 449 okay. rule. But it still has that, calories. That said, though, if you were to actually do measurement of unique amino acids, they're going to have some amount of okay. caloric impact. Okay. Well, what I but, said still stays yeah. though, still because three grams of essential amino acids are going to give you the same essential amino acid rise in your blood than 20 grams of complete yes. It's still less calories. Significantly less calories. Yeah, yeah. and sig significantly less overall impact, yes. Okay, so if I had- And what I would say is the more muscle protein synthesis you spike- the greater the diet induced thermogenesis, the greater the impact to your total metabolism. It's, it's going right? to be better. It's yeah. gonna be, so my point is, is yeah. the same, right? You, okay, you're, you're hitting your calories. We want to get a little benefit of extra essential amino acids. Three grams of essential amino acids is going to be like 20 grams a shake or six grams is going to be like mm -hmm. a 40 gram shake. Still less calories. Let's go with that. So we have the less calories, but we still get some of the anabolic effects that we're looking for. Yes. Okay. And oftentimes for people who are having a hard time eating enough, What's found, what's, what's curious is that many people actually like, like to use essential amino acid supplements to help curb their appetite Yeah, because it does have, it does have an effect of like re regulating your overall amino acid balance. Sure. Right. So it's like to some, extent. to some effect and kind of boosting energy and mood, et cetera. And so some people use it for that, but in more mm, clinical populations, like older people or people in really aggressive weight loss or people who are using maybe a drug induced weight loss type situation. Yeah, like a GLP-1. Yeah, where they're having a really hard mm -hmm. time just like eating enough. It's much easier to consume that extra amount and have it not affect the rest oh, of the well, what you have, we, I mean, yeah. sharing with the audience, yeah. that's how this conversation all yeah, happens. That's how this right? Happened. I mean, Angelo and I have been talking for quite some time now and I had told him that, listen, we're about to take this test group through GLP-1s and if ever I saw a a definite situation where I would highly recommend branch chain amino acids or essential amino acids. This is the case right here because what I've learned personally going through it and then watching other people, they struggle to hit a thousand calories. And in that situation, I've like, I mean, you can't you can't tell them to have five shakes in a day. They just yeah. they won't even build a stomach and I'll get see, it down. Protein is too. Mm -hmm. it's, it's really really difficult. Yeah, one mm -hmm. shake. You know, a twenty. To use your example, three grams of essential essential amino acids is much more like water than 20 gram protein shake. Mm -hmm. So it's just a lot easier to get down when you can't eat more. And so now it becomes a very valuable, in my opinion, very valuable supplement in those populations. Yeah. But so one more aspect to, uh, or question that I have, if we go back to some of the studies you brought up, one thing that um, sometimes is misleading is mm -hmm. you look at a study that says, if you do cardio on an empty stomach, you'll see more fat oxidation or uh, ketogenic diet increases fat oxidation 300% over mm -hmm. a traditional diet.
But at the end of the day, who cares how much body fat did you lose versus not? Because fat oxidation doesn't necessarily mean you lost body fat, right? If you're in a ket ket ketogenic state, your fat oxidation is going to go through the roof. But if you're in a calorie surplus, you're not going to lose any body fat. When they're doing these studies on essential amino acid concentrations, on muscle protein synthesis, are they controlling it? In other words, are we looking at two groups, same calories, exercise, everything's the same, except this one has uh, more essential amino acids in their blood. And are we seeing that turning to more muscle or less mm -hmm. muscle loss or better performance? Or is it just a measure of muscle protein synthesis, essential amino acid concentrations? Hey, real quick, sorry to interrupt you. Look, we have a sale this month on some programs. We have a beginner program, Map Starter. It's 50% off. Then we have a bundle that's different. It's called the Starter Bundle. That includes our most popular programs. That's also 50% off. So if you're interested in that, just click on the link at the top of the description below. Now, this episode is brought to you by NASM. This is the world's best premier national certification for personal trainers. And right now, if you go to nasmpt.com, you can get 50% off the performance enhancement specialization certifications. Great certification for trainers who want to train athletes or people to improve their athletic performance. All right, here comes the show. That's a great question. I really heard two questions in it. One is like, hey, how solid are these studies? Like, yes. are, are these controls really being put in place? And the second thing I actually heard you allude to is, what about the human outcomes? Totally. Like, you can blah, blah, blah me all day about these mechanistic things, about what a muscle protein synthesis is. And did it's you like, get more muscle? Did people get more muscle? Like, <laughs> yeah. what happened in the end, right? And so I'll answer both of them. So first of all, what I'd say is, when we're talking about essential amino acid studies and protein studies, oftentimes they're combined. Like this whole, this whole like uh, research area is largely driven by universities very, that have like longevity departments. Okay. It's like geriatric departments. There's also lots of studies and the same people end up doing studies though for like the military or for NASA or mm -hmm. NIH and for sports. But like within academia, like that's where a lot of the funding is. And, um, and there's a lot of these studies. So this is not like uh, there's a lot of these studies and they tend to be crossovers between protein, whey protein and EAA okay. freeform crystalline studies. So it's not like, oh, there's like 20 studies I'm talking about. There's hundreds of studies on humans. And these studies go everywhere from basically actually measuring what they call fractional synthetic rate, which is more the mechanistic stuff where they're actually measuring, hey, what's the, they put like a tracer, a color basically on these amino acids. They measure like, hey, how much of that gets from, you know, the actual digestion into the muscle, or they measure like different amounts of the actual increase of, of the muscle itself. Okay. Um, that said, it's acute. It's like in this very short time frame, right? So then again, the question be like, well, what happens like longer term? Yes. There's lots of human outcome studies where it's like you put a group of these, of these women on um, basically seven and a half grams of EAAs twice a day for three months versus the control group. They put on several more pounds of muscle. Okay. And both doing resistance training twice a week, everything controlled for. So what I'd say is- Is the protein intake high in the other group though? In other words, is it better than a high protein intake? Or is there a benefit? Mm -hmm. If I'm eating mm -hmm. one gram of protein mm -hmm. per pound of body weight, am I going to benefit from supplementing with essential amino acids? That's a great question. And what I would say is it depends on who you are. Okay. Right? It depends on who you are. So what I would say is if you are in your 20s, and you go to the gym a few times a week and you on a maintenance calorie kind of diet mm -hmm. and you eat about a gram of protein per pound of body weight, going back to what I said earlier, I think something like essential amino acids or even the benefit of whey protein over whole food protein, because mm -hmm. whey protein is not whole food protein. It's also a supplement. Yes, it is. Right. But like choosing a protein powder or an EA supplement, which is even more effective than that, the benefit of it is just it's less for you. It's, mm -hmm. it's less it's less important. That said, if you are 45 years old, right, and you're eating a gram of protein uh, per pound of body weight, and you're training a couple times per week, there's probably some benefit. There's probably some benefit of adding essential amino acids in once a day because your the, the gram of protein per pound of body weight is simply not the same thing for you okay. as it was for you when you were 25. You're not the same. It's it's a very different situation, mm -hmm. and that's because your ability to digest that that gram of protein becomes reduced, and your sensitivity to the amino acids in the protein to stimulate muscle protein synthesis goes down. So that, that's one of the biggest issues with aging populations. They need more protein, period. Yeah, well, is that like the sensitivity, like, and it's also, it's true for resistance training too. And this is not to discourage people, like you should resistance train maybe even more and mm -hmm. even eat even more protein. But as you age, the benefits you get 
they do decrease. Sure. You simply do not stimulate as much. Well, that's not controversial. Yeah. 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 So it's like, uh, and so it's the exact same thing with protein. So a gram of protein per pound of body weight for a 45 year old is not the same as thing for a 25 year old. And then that means, and then for 60, even more. For 60, even more. So the, I think that's the nuance in this where it's like, people might be like, you know, I eat enough protein, so I don't even need that. And it's like, well, how active are you? How old are you? And then Mm -hmm. going to the point we were at earlier, are you trying to lose weight right now? I mean, I, I wouldn't advise people to always be trying to lose weight, but if you are in a phase where you're trying mm. to lose fat and maintain muscle, there's significant advantages to it on top of the gram of protein. But I think your core question though, too, is like in all these studies where they always already eating a gram of protein yeah. per pound of body weight, I think in many cases they were consuming something closer to probably 0. 0.7, 0. 0.8. Okay. Some though, they're likely consuming a gram. Well, I, the, and it, and that's, not, that's what I'm saying. It's not like I'm talking about one study. It's like a, we're talking about a whole area of research. And also, Angela, look, we, yeah. we, we're trainers. We train people for decades, okay? Yeah. I, you know, I, I can hold up on one hand how many people I train that consistently ate a gram of protein per pound of body weight right. without me having to, like, coach them through it. Like, mm-hmm. nobody does that. So the value of protein supplementation or even, you know, essential amino acid supplementation just from a, um, like, like a real-world standpoint, I mean— for a lot of people benefit. A lot of people will take a scoop of protein, notice there's huge benefits, but it's because they just don't eat a lot of protein. Yeah. They simply don't. That's well, that becomes a big I thing. also I really like the way you set the table earlier to go back to what you said, especially when you're younger and you're like, you know, at that point, you're 20 years old. Like, I think there's a lot to be said about creating good habits and behaviors around eating steak and broccoli and whole foods. Like yeah. instead of skipping right to, hey, let's just default to mm-hmm. shakes and, and pills to try and get it. It's like you probably should try and build those behaviors as much as possible while you're young, why it doesn't make that much of an impact. And then as you age, you recognize, OK, this is kind of how I eat. I'm always under this word becomes more essential or important for you to do that. So I, th- I think the way you've set the table on it is is really good too, because that's what I would advise still a young kid. I would never tell a kid like automatically default to supplementation for anything. It's like, dude, you got to find a way to learn better behaviors around trying to hit these targets through Whole Foods. But the truth is, like Sal's yeah. point, very rarely Here, did I ever hit a client that actually could hit that. Here's a place we didn't touch on that I think, uh, and I would love, um, if you're well-versed on this, which it sounds like you probably are, I would love some commentary on um, that isn't talked about enough. Many of the studies, and you kind of talked about this, there's longevity departments. Mm -hmm. A lot of the studies on on essential amino acids, protein, amino acids in general, revolve around longevity and or recovery. Some of the first uh, amino acid-based studies were done on like burn victims Mm -hmm. or people who had severe trauma to the body. Mm -hmm. How important is protein for somebody when they're hurt, damaged, injured, Injured, uh, they got burned, sunburned, whatever? Significantly more. Mm-hmm. And the reason why is going back to the same term of being anabolically resistant. All that means is that your, bo- your body is in a resistant state where it doesn't want to maintain or build muscle. It's prioritizing other things at that time. On top of that, as you can imagine, uh, the burn victims is, is an excellent example. And honestly, like the authors of like the International Society of Sports Nutrition position paper, they're the guys that did those burn victim mm-hmm. studies like 20 years ago. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's all the same community of these types of researchers who have done this work. Um, what happens in those cases is that the amount of muscle protein breakdown is gigantic. It's huge. It's huge. Like they are just breaking down so many proteins and the increased need to try to replace this, this affected tissue is so great. The importance of protein becomes only that much more like it. So I would say in situations of injury, uh, illness, like the importance of protein again becomes amplified. Oh yeah. Well, would, would you, could you throw in that category then too? I know we're talking about extreme yeah. things like burning, but wouldn't like, uh, overtraining and extent it like overly in, uh, applying intensity in your training totally. cause a similar effect also? Uh, Yes, for a couple of ways. One, I would say it's like, I mean, it would depend on like what type of overtraining, but if you're overtraining so much that you're releasing all these additional stress hormones, yeah. then yes, the stress hormones are actually going to prevent the amount of muscle protein synthesis. Yeah, well, that I mean, let's put it what and, real world people do. Yeah. Five days of CrossFit uh-huh. and training for an hour to two hours mm-hmm. of uh, intense training happens all the time. Oh, yeah, with if you're people- taking time off to recover, well, if you want to recover faster, like, get your protein or essential amino acids up. I mean, What's funny is that some of the places now that are that are using essential amino acid supplementation or what could be labeled as anti-catabolic amino acids or metabolites like HMB or mm-hmm. whatever, 
um, are nursing homes, mm -hmm. you know, like places where people, and they're finding like longevity improve and people live longer because they're giving them <laughs> supplements that were designed for athletes and bodybuilders is quite interesting. So that's where it's almost like, you know, if you have grandparents and you want to give them something that might help them, like give them a, a protein supplement or essential amino acid. Amino acid for supplement. real. I mean, that's, I mean, that's my sense too. It's like when, cause I get, you know, emails and texts from like all types of people from friends that, you know, yeah. I went to high school with and like, ah, my son is tr training in sports now. Like what supplement should he take? If any, all the way to like, you know, what should I do with my mom who yeah. is, is getting injured? And what I would say is that again, um, you know, for like younger people, the focus on supplementation should be this additive thing that could increase your performance that much more. And it is true. Like if you take essential amino acids before you train, you will get more benefit than if you hadn't. Mm. And it will be significantly more than also protein. Similarly, if you take creatine every day, unless you're you know one of the rare people that, that uh, is, has resistance to it, like you're going to have more phosphocreatine stores in your cells mm -hmm. and you're going to get more output. You're going to get another one or two reps. Like that's what's going to happen. But like, that's why you would do it. Whereas when you get older or you're injured, it's like you're doing it to just like be o kind of be okay. To right? not, yeah, to, to, to not suffer. Yeah. To not yeah. wither. To have, yeah, to not wither, to have good basic health, yeah. to be able to overcome, you know, uh, short-term issues. You know, and, and I'd say maybe going back to this burn victim uh, one, I believe the burn victim store... Uh, research studies were actually before the NASA studies, mm -hmm. but there were, uh, and I, I believe that's what actually led to them getting the NASA studies. Uh, there's studies in uh, basically it was in 2004 where, you know, NASA is trying to understand, Hey, how can we have people in space retain their yeah. muscle? Right. It's a it's by the way, it's priority. It's, it's a no big resistance. problem. Yeah. It's yeah. a big problem. They're living big out in the space wasting. station and they come back with osteoporosis. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, it's, it's, there's, there's, there's no resistance, right? right? And so are there, you know, drug interventions, nutritional interventions. And so uh, a study was conducted and I, I believe it was through the Texas medical branch, but that's the one that's done a ton of okay. the studies back in the early two thousands. Um, and basically what it is, they had young participants. These are people, I think they're like 20, um, at complete bed rest for 28 days. So the only thing they were able to do is they could get out of the bed to like poop, <laughs> But otherwise, they couldn't leave the bed. You imagine signing up for this, by the way? <laughs> We're going to give you 500 <laughs> bucks to do nothing. <laughs> so, uh, typical 20 year olds are cool, right? Yeah, yeah, play video yeah, games. Yeah. And then after six or get seven days, they actually really started to go crazy. Oh, I bet. So, in the subsequent studies, they, they, they could get enough results. And within seven days, they shortened the studies because it was like it, people were going crazy. But they gave them three meals a day. And then they did an intervention of these higher doses of essential amino acids with some carbohydrates because they thought it was important to, to spike the insulin um, twice a day. And the experimental group, the group that got the EAAs, lost no muscle mass after 28 days of complete bed rest. Wait a minute. Back Whoa. up. Back up. No muscle loss? They lost no muscle mass. They With lost no strength. activity. With no activity. Wow. That's crazy. That's fascinating. That's insane. Yeah. That's and this crazy. is like 2000, I mean, this is 2004. But that's a lot. I mean, that's like you're taking- That's ridiculous. You're taking a lot, like high doses of EAAs. But, yeah, but when you think about, hey, I'm at bed rest or I'm injured or I can't do something, like that's like- that's it. And I can't train. Okay. So yeah. let's back up yeah. again. I'm finding some more places now where this mm -hmm. will be valuable. Uh, I hurt my knee. I can't work out my legs. I broke my arm. Totally. Yeah. I'm sick. You're mobile. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm in bed or whatever. How do, cause we get this question all the time. How do I bounce back? How do I prevent yeah. myself from losing muscle? Right. So what you're saying is one of the most effective things as shown in some of these studies is have some essential amino acids throughout the day while you're not able to move your leg. Exactly. It'll minimize at the very least the muscle loss that you'll experience. Yes. Wow. And studies have shown that literally even at 28 days, they lost no muscle. That was, they were taking 16.5 grams twice a day. So that would be like, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's not- How many not, scoops of your- That's like three scoops. That's like a little over three scoops twice a day. It's not that much. That's, it's not crazy, you that's know? Not, nothing um, I wouldn't do. And yeah. I, <laughs> <laughs> right, I would do it. Um, yeah. And just to clarify, it would, which is kind of the maximum dose that's been shown to work. Sure. It's somewhere between 15 and 18 grams beyond that. You don't- stimulate really any additional muscle protein synthesis. It's pretty linear from three grams to four to five to six, all the way up to 15 to 18 like that. It's pretty, it's like you get that much more benefit. So already if you took 10 grams, it is like that much better than only taking three grams, but three grams is like the, Interesting. the minimum. Wait, now, uh, all right. Best time to take essential amino acid supplement. Does it matter if you take it with a meal or is it better in between meals before bed when you wake empty up? Stomach, empty yeah. stomach. Um, yeah. uh, so again, I think it, I think it depends on what your daily habits are and what works for you. But well, I'll give this overall guidance. And I think, yes. I think you guys will probably agree with it, but push back if you disagree. Sure. Okay. So um, overall, what's most important is protein intake per day. 
and I would say actually essential amino acid intake per day. So sure. it means like high quality, complete proteins with very bioavailable essential okay. amino acids. Like you get in that gram of protein per pound of body weight per day, like that's like, that's the, that's the base that you probably want to start with. And if you need to use essential amino acids to help you get there, that's, yeah, that's good. That's fine. But it's like just getting it in per day. Then the idea of timing is important. But again, I think like the more in maintenance mode you are, or the younger you are, the less important it is. The more you're really trying to optimize, mm -hmm. get that extra 15 to 20% of benefit, timing essential amino acid intake every three to four hours does increase the total amount of muscle protein synthesis you will get in a given day. Okay. Now, does, it, does prioritizing change too if we're in the context of somebody who's like, uh, I used to play basketball for like two, two and a half hours straight, uh -huh. right? Probably, yeah. I'm assuming before and after that or during. Before and after that would be ideal. Yeah, right, so I right. think any like strenuous exercise, definitely. But even outside of strenuous exercise, just in general, if you were trying to really optimize your every protein intake, hours. you would eat at protein or essential amino acids every three to four hours. So- um, again, you don't have to do that. And I would start with just getting enough every day. So what I would say is in general, it's like, if you have a hard time overall getting in enough protein per day, I would not use a supplement to hit the bare minimum. Bare minimum of the, of the government of the RDA is 0.4 yeah. grams of uh, 0.4 grams of protein per pound of body weight. I think more recent research shows it's closer to 0.6. Yeah. So like, don't like you need to eat at least that much real food. But then if you're going above that, I would say anytime you can get it in, like anytime you can get a scoop of essential amino acids in or anytime you can get a protein powder and that that works for you. If you can control it though, you would space it out to where you're either eating protein or you're taking a supplement every three to four hours. Okay, so that sounds to me like that helps support the old adage of eating six small meals a day too. Yeah, I mean, I'm not, I'm not trying to embrace that adage for any other purposes. I mean, I'm not, e I'm not trying synthesis. to push it either. Yeah. But I mean, it does kind of help support yeah. that old body bodybuilder it's, adage. There's it conflicting is evidence nutrient around nutrient that. Yeah. But, but you're he, you're you're quoting research specifically in essential amino acid yeah. supplementation. Essential amino acid. What, what I'm quoting is here's the background of the science that I'm describing. Mm -hmm. When you consume a high enough dose of uh, essential amino acids in a protein, right? it stimulates uh, a bout, basically, of muscle protein synthesis, and it lasts for about three hours. Got it. It depends, though. It's like the debates between whey protein and casein. Casein, it lasts longer. longer. Right. Whey protein, it's a little bit shorter. But let's just say it's about three to four hours. And when you consume that, if then like an hour into it, you eat a little bit more protein, it doesn't do, it doesn't do anything. It doesn't extend it. It doesn't make it higher. It's mm -hmm. like not really utilized. And so if, you're, if your real primary goal is like, hey, I want to maximize the amount of muscle protein synthesis in total that I can stimulate in a given day, then using protein timing to break it up into a few smaller meals that maximize the amount of the muscle protein synthesis will increase the total amount a day. But again, what I'm trying to name is like, it's not the most important thing. Right. And if you, and so if you used essential amino acids in that way, and that is why they did it for the NASA studies and the NIH studies and the older women's yeah. studies, they have them eat three times a day, eating about 0 0.7, 0 0.8 grams of protein per pound of body weight distributed evenly in those three meals. And then in the in-between periods, they added the essential, they added the essential amino acids and they got the most consistent amount of total spikes of, pro it. of protein synthesis throughout the day. And that led to the women after a few months, having a few more pounds of muscle than the control group. So it's like, it's, it's, I think it's both a, uh, mechanistic thing that we understand, but there's also like human outcomes that show wow. that, that it works. So I would say like, if that's what works for you, like kind of putting in between meals that mm -hmm. works, I would also say though, and this is something that again, I was more resistant to it because I, I think just like my age and my experience, what I thought was important, the idea of consuming essential amino acids with food. I was like, why would you do that? Yeah. It's like, it's, it's the thing in the food. Like, you know, why would it matter? And it was actually Dr. Ferrando who helped educate me on the fact that dude, if you look at, if you look at the spikes of the muscle protein synthesis and what the concentrations of the EAAs do, that if you consume this EAA beverage, before your meal. And he's thinking more for like, you know, 50 year olds and 60 year olds before your hamburger, it is going to now create this spike in muscle protein synthesis that better utilizes the EAAs and the pro and the other amino acids in the burger itself okay. to be prioritized for building new muscle. So you actually get better You'll use of the size it better that yeah, way. You actually utilize the protein the, the the amino acids that are in that protein source better than mm. you would have had you not. So 
I think consuming mm. it with meals can also make sense. Um, I, typically, I, I would think like lower protein meals. But again, if you're if you're in a sense, if, if you're doing more aggressive caloric restriction or you're over 50, it could, it, it could yeah. start to make a lot more sense. I really feel like mm. uh -huh. Angelo has just vindicated all my bodybuilder bros that have, been <laughs> sipping, that have been sipping on pink lemonade BCAAs all fucking day yeah. and you guys have been hammering them for well, years. But it's, not, but it's not BCAAs. Yeah. It's essential yeah. amino acids. But, but we, we should handle yeah. the There's a big difference. There's a, there's, a, there's a difference. Yeah, they showed. Uh -huh. I've read studies like that. Mm. The branched amino acid compared to essential. It's the essential amino acids that stimulate protein synthesis. You need the, the other essentials not just the leucine isoleucine available so let's compare those because i do yeah. know that's probably a mistake yeah. that's made a lot as people just get bcaa's and think uh -huh. that's doing the same thing but i think a lot of like the more seasoned bodybuilder bros they do the eaa yeah. Yeah, and yeah. for this reason and this has been pretty available information for a long time and i will i mean i have these types of conversations often i think we go into a little bit more nuance for your audience because you guys like are more really in this space so here's the deal all this amino acid protein research that has turned into marketed products began like 40 years ago. Yep. Right. And they're studying protein and they're, you're trying to see like what they, you know, how it can create benefits or not. And like bodybuilders are involved in this type of stuff. And the thing that gets discovered is that like, Hey, inside of protein, there are these essential amino acids. And of those essential amino acids, three of them are called the branch chain amino acids. It's literally just the way that they're um, structured. They look like a branch, right? But of them, leucine, isoleucine, and valine seem to be really important. Like the foods that have more of them uh, tend to tend to promote more muscle protein synthesis. Like there's something in this. And, uh, and they do a series of studies and what gets uncovered is like, yeah, BCAAs. If you just take the BCAAs, they will stimulate muscle protein synthesis. You don't need you don't need the other six. So you definitely don't even need the other mm. 11 non-essential. And, you know, a whole business takes off. And so people start making BCA supplements. And what we uncovered over time, and this became more and more clear in the 2000s, but then very clear in the, in the teens and is completely basically refuted by 2017. The International Society of Sports Nutrition put out a paper and basically said BCAAs, it's called BCAAs, myth or reality. Mm. And it's very clear that it says that they are not anabolic on their own. And this is why going back to this broader discussion we've been having about EAA concentration. You need a high concentration of all of the EAAs, all nine in the blood. And ideally you actually would have higher proportion of the leucine and the isoleucine and the valine and also lysine. So in addition to the branch chain amino acids, there's this like uh, fourth buddy, lysine, who's actually really important because he's slower to get into the muscle tissue. Lysine's uh, non-essential. No, it's essential. It's essential, okay. It's okay. essential, but it's also a limiting factor oh, I see. for protein I synthesis. See. And so you really need, you need all four of them, but you also need, you need all nine of the essential amino acids. And what studies have shown, and this is on a more mechanistic basis, but they also have human outcome studies, that when someone takes the BCAAs, you get this gigantic spike in muscle protein synthesis and then a crash. And what happens with that crash is that the net impact is nothing. Because of the crash. Because of the crash. There's, there's, there's literally, it's not anabolic. So um, BCAAs, if taken on their own for the purpose of anabolism, do not work. Point blank. Like that's, okay. like, that's what the study will show. The nuance I would add is if you were to take BCAAs and you were to add them to a whey protein powder and take them at the same time, you would improve the benefits of that whey protein powder. Couldn't you just because do that? you would have jacked up the leucine and the I was the just going to say, couldn't you just do it with leucine? Mm. Uh, no, okay. you couldn't just do it with leucine. Okay, so you yeah, need the if, other if, two. If, you, if you jack up, if you jack up the leucine, it would help. But I, but I believe, and I have to look at the exact numbers on that. But okay. basically, the proportions that you would need if you jacked up the leucine too much, if the if the isoleucine and the valine were okay. increased at the same time, they, they it would become a limiting factor. <laughs> so. You know, there's something there. There's like if you, you know, if you're maybe vegan and you eat really, um, honestly, low quality plant based proteins, typically, uh, then low quality, not meaning it's impossible. So, again, I'm no, not. You like, just need a lot more of it to do the same thing. You just need a lot more of it. That really is. You need a lot more. So, you got to protect yourself from getting attacked by yeah. all the vegans. Well, no, no, it's just. <laughs> no, and I also want to be fair to it. Like, I'm not, I'm not saying, I just think you have to. You have to eat a lot more food and you also have to be observant of the fact that like that food is then wrapped in other calories. It's wrapped in carbohydrates. Yeah, of course. So you got to move a lot more. Yeah, 40 grams of protein from yeah. a whole vegan source looks a lot different. Uh, yeah. It's a lot more food. It's a lot more whatever. Yeah. That's just a fact. Yeah. So if you used a supplement like a 
these days to potentially optimize it, you could. So maybe there's something there mm -hmm. and maybe there's something to BCAAs during workouts to help because it's so high in the leucine to help prevent like the central fatigue hypothesis. Mm -hmm. But across the board, I would just be like, why? Like, yeah. just, go with, essential it's just go with essential it's amino acids. Just yeah. go with essential amino acids. Like you can, I mean, they're both available at like every, you know, these stores, like it's so much more effective across the board. You don't have to combine it. And also, even if you combine the EAAs with whey protein, they've also been shown to make the whey protein more effective. So it's like, I just wouldn't waste my time or money with the BCAAs. I think the best, uh, great information, by the way, I think the best selling point for me is in communicating the, because calories is a big deal. And, and, and taking 40 grams of protein means you're going to have 160 extra calories. Taking six grams of essential amino acids is far less calories, but would produce the same, based off what you were saying, essential amino acid spike in the blood and give you kind of a, a similar effect, so long as you're already hitting your protein, because now we got all the factors controlled. So for me, that's a great selling point. It's like, look, we don't need to bump your calories that much to get this anabolic effect. You can just do it with essential amino acids and it's a little bit of calories. Well, listen, we just Not had much. a live caller today. That's right. Mm -hmm. We just had a live caller that today, perfectly. literally. Totally. And what we, when we listened to her breakdown of her strength training two times a week, she was doing uh, 10 hours, five sessions, two hour blocks of pickleball. And she's at this hard plateau and she inconsistently hits 100 grams or less of protein a day. And so this would be a perfect example. Oh, you don't of, want to bump your calories much? You can right, do that right. You yeah, and she's also concerned about eating too much, putting on it. And so like, yeah, she's and she's yeah. okay where she's at calorie-wise. This would be a perfect example yeah. of someone that so, you could recommend. Because so, I know one of my friends is going to listen to this episode because mm -hmm. they're they're experts on protein. So I know Lane is going to listen to this, Lane yeah. Norton. So mm -hmm. he would agree with everything you're saying or is he going to tear this apart? <laughs> I, lo I, lo I, love, the, I love the idea of Lane listening. Well, to he speak. does, but he's, yeah. I, I know that. Yeah. I, I mean, he's, he's like yeah. the protein guy, right? Yeah. He breaks things down. He's the guy I send shit to. Whenever there's a study that I'm confused about. I'll send it to Lane. He always breaks it down well for me. So. Uh -huh. uh, I, I love that idea. I follow Lane. Okay. I like Lane's, um, I like the performative aspects of how Lane goes about yeah, it. Yeah. And uh, he clearly knows his stuff. Um, what I would say is that there, everything that I have shared here comes from that International Society of Sports Nutrition paper. Okay. That International Society uh, of Sports Nutrition paper has like 22 contributors to it. Um, the lead authors are very well known within cool. the space. Um, and there's over, a, I think there's like 137 references mm -hmm. to this, right? Um, so I don't think he's going to come and listen to this and review this and be like, oh, that's that's not true. Yeah. That's not something. I don't think um, so either. I, I, my question would be like, I, I don't know, Lane, like, is there an aspect of this that you felt like I, you know, I bent or I misrepresented or I didn't, you know, I think that that's where it all comes down to, mm -hmm. right? It's kind of like, there's a bunch of data, there's a bunch of studies. Um, I think you presented it very, how do you, yeah, very well. I, I'm trying, yeah, I'm trying to share it in like a, in like a fair context and represent everything. I, I don't think there's anything he's going to say that's like, that's totally, you know. No, I, th I think you. No. I think you were very fair. I think yeah. based off of what I know, I'm not a, a, uh, an expert like Lane, and and uh, it's not my my favorite area uh, to study because I learned so many things about fitness. But I think what you're saying is quite accurate, and I do think that there are some applications where this is very va valuable. I think one of them is in individuals who can't, who are who have a difficulty eating more. Mm -hmm. Essential amino acid drinks are easy. It's just a fact. Like I could take a 40 gram shake. Which is kind of easy, but uh, you know, a, a a six gram shake of essential amino acids is real easy. That's like water. It's like flavored water. Um, and I also see tremendous benefit for someone who wants to control their calories if they're going to get a similar effect. They're eating high protein. Tremendous benefit and and advanced age clients that we know yeah. struggle that with one's calories huge. and protein. That one's huge. I mean, that, be, like, oh, that becomes almost like the way we would always recommend creatine. I almost right. feel like now longevity. Now you're 60 years old. Like, hey, just add this into your diet. You totally. probably need it. We're probably. I don't. Ha I can't remember the last time we spoke to a 60 year old who's like, yeah, I'm crushing 150 to 200 grams Nobody. of protein every Nobody. day. Like you just don't hear that. Nobody. So I just feel like that should be like almost a staple supplement, especially yeah. for them. Now here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to experiment. Okay. So I'm pretty yeah. good about hitting, uh, I wouldn't say I hit, you know, like, like my upper limit of protein, but I get around 180 to 210 grams a day. I weigh about 215 or so. I'm going to experiment. I'm going to take essential amino acids on top of my normal meals. I'll do it in between meals. I'm pretty sensitive to supplements. You can ask my my, my partners here. They'll tell you. And then I'll, I'll, I'll give some feedback. Do I notice a difference? Do I notice no difference? 
Um, and it's pretty easy to add, tastes good, and it's like whatever, no problem. I've never had an issue adding supplements to <laughs> what I'm doing, so I'll, I'll let you know. Sounds great. Know what I love yeah. it. I would love to hear that. Absolutely, I would love to hear that. No, and I think overall, like this has been the this is the best approach to take these types of conversations because there's totally. a bunch of like academics and scientists studying this stuff. And then there's people more from industry that are taking that information, trying to build products around it. And then there's people like you that are just trying to educate and support people. And it's somewhere in the mix of all that, right? right. It's like, it's not like this thing is this perfect pill that's going to yeah. solve everything. You know, and there are people, I would just say that there are people out there that market essential amino acids by shitting on whey. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I'm I like, hate that. So and I'm like, dude, you're like, like, what are you doing? I'm like, you're crazy, man. That's where like, you like, got your, you like, uh, yeah. your essential amino acids from. Yeah, what are you yeah, doing? Yeah, I'm like, have you like, have you, have you read? <laughs> yeah. What'd you say? It's actually not extracted from whey. No, but, but you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but like, uh, yeah, because you can get vegan. You see, uh, eat, yeah. Uh, Mo, I mean, I like a lot of high quality ones are vegan. It's right, fermentation right, right. process. Right, right, right. It's you know, it's so it's not like they're breaking down of the proteins. They're actually it's it's through a fermentation process, which again I think is great. They support vegans in that way. That's right. Like it's very safe for vegans. Oh my God. If you're a uh, vegan and you don't supplement with essential amino acids, you're dumb. I, this is the, the hmm. I knew that for, de I'd known that for over two decades. All my vegan clients that I would give them essential amino acid supplements, it was like I gave them steroids. It was like hmm. such a big difference in muscle and performance and strength. Like that and creatine are the staple supplements for every vegan I ever worked with, 100%. Well, you, you won me over with your initial in the first 20 minutes when we, you brought up the, recommending to the 20 year old kid that because even if you are to get a little bit more benefits by doing the EAAs, uh, behaviorally speaking, you're better off teaching yourself to eat whole foods and belt. <laughs> totally. And I just think that's great advice. Even if you might get a better protein since it's spike from doing the EAAs, you, at some point in your life, you probably need to teach yourself to have balanced meals and mm -hmm. teach. And so I think that's healthy, good advice. And then it makes total sense as we age and then you're in calorie deficits and then so I thought for considering your bias, you actually position it in a no, very great. unbiased way. It Thanks. Great. Love it. Appreciate Love it. it. I'll yeah. test it out and let you know what happens. Good. It's yeah, been yeah. a fun conversation. Thanks. Yeah, 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 I yeah. appreciate yeah. you coming on the show. I know you, you know our, our, how we've communicated EAs and, and now we communicate them a little differently because they're, you know, GLP ones are now in the, in the, in the mix. And I say, Oh my God, people can't eat enough, let alone, you know, eating more protein or whatever. But uh, I think you made some pretty good cases. So I, I love it. It's very, I mean, God, we've been doing this so long. It's rare that we get someone to kind of uh, shatter a paradigm a bit on something. So I, I felt that way today, yeah. which is cool. cool. Very cool, man. Thanks cool. for coming on, man. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, guys. Appreciate yeah, yeah. it. Appreciate right it. All right. I know you liked that episode. If you did, check this one out 30% body fat. For men, this is way too high. This is actually a bit high for women as well. So in today's episode, we're talking about how you can go from 30 to 10. What is 10% body fat? This is when you have a visible six pack. Can you go from 30 to 10%? Yes, it's possible, but not if you guess along the way. So we're going to talk about how you can do that in today's episode. Now, there's a huge range, right, of like body types. Yes. Some people can run uh, a little bit heavier uh, and, or a little bit higher body.